All right, so uh, hello everyone, and thank you for joining our very first Urban Shift webinar. My name is Emily White. I am the City Business Engagement Lead for Urban Shift at C40, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this event today, where we will explore how can cities engage the private sector to implement nature-based solutions with a focus on the city of Freetown in Sierra Leone. Before we get started, let me just run through a few technical details. Uh, perfect. Firstly, this webinar will all be in English, um, but we will also have live French interpretation during the webinar. You can enable it by clicking interpretation at the bottom of your screen and selecting French. Secondly, we really welcome any questions you have for any of our speakers or about the program itself. So please post these in the Q&A box as shown on the slides on the screen. Next slide, please. So for those of you who don't already know, Urban Shift is a joint initiative funded by the Global Environment Facility and led by the United Nations Environment Programme in partnership with the World Resources Institute, C40 Cities, ICLE, the United Nations Development Programme, the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. Urban Shift focuses on transforming 23 cities in seven countries through integrated urban planning approaches and building capacity in cities to shift to greener and healthier economies. So for the next hour, we will have a mixture of presentations and discussions with experts on this topic of how cities can engage the private sector on nature-based solutions. I am joined by my colleague Diego Riano, who is head of Urban Shift at C40, who will give us an overview of the importance of city to business collaboration to promote nature-based solutions. I'm also joined by my colleague, Rebecca Ilunga, who is the Water Security Network Manager at C40 and lead of our recent C40 Urban Nature Declaration launch. And finally, for those of you who joined our launch event last month, you will have heard from Mayor Yvonne Akisoya about Freetown's campaign to plant 1 million trees in the city by 2022 and to increase tree cover by 50%. Well, today we are joined by Eric Hubbard, who is the Technical Advisor for Environmental Management at Freetown City Council and Tree Champion for the Freetown, the Tree Town campaign. And he will take us deeper into that conversation to understand how the city has been working with the private sector partners to finance this initiative. A warm welcome to all of our speakers here today. I will now hand the mic over to Diego for his opening remarks. Thank you, Emily, and welcome everyone again to this webinar. It's great to see so many people connected already. Cities and nature are connected in multiple ways. Cities occupy land where infrastructure is built, land that at some point was part of a natural ecosystem and it has changed over time. In addition to land, cities all over the world are endowed with incredible biodiversity. As cities expand in population and in area, it is very important to protect key ecosystems and species located inside and outside our cities. For example, many natural ecosystems in peri-urban areas provide key essential services to cities, such as clean water and energy generation. With over 50% of the global population, cities have an enormous footprint. 80% of the global GDP is produced in cities, and at the same time, cities produce 70% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. Cities are our economic hubs of production, consumption, and waste. In fact, we could argue that cities are actually part of nature. Cities are embedded in a larger natural environment that makes possible our very existence or can put us at risk. This is becoming ever more apparent with the multiple natural disasters that have affected cities in the last decade as a result of the current climate crisis. Millions of people have been affected by floods, landslides, and heat waves. And during the last 20 months, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us how far the unsustainable destruction of nature can take us. This has been at many levels and at Wakeney an awakening call. Mandatory lockdowns and travel restrictions have exacerbated the call for urban green spaces 
to breathe healthy air and connect with nature as part of our well being. The good news is that many cities are determined to take action and have replied back to citizens' claims. We see a new generation of nature based solutions being implemented in many parts of the world, from rain gardens, green corridors, river in restoration to urban forests. Nature-based solutions include many possible actions, protect, manage, and restore natural ecosystems and biodiversity, increase resilience to climate hazards, increase our carbon storage or avoid greenhouse gases emissions, and ultimately provide human well-being. Bringing nature back to cities is critical. We could all agree with that. But funding and implementing nature-based solutions can be a tricky task for cities. In Urban Shift, we believe that when cities engage and cooperate with businesses and citizens, cities can unlock their expertise, finance, build public ownership, and ultimately enable new business models to support the implementation of nature-based solutions that will generate jobs and create a shared prosperity in harmony with nature. We believe this could be a win-win solution. Today, I hope you learn more about how cities and businesses are collaborating to implement nature-based solutions, and in particular, learn from the bold and innovative Freetown experience. I really hope you enjoy the webinar, and thank you for tuning in today. Over to you, Emily. Thank you very much, Diego, for those inspiring words um, and amazing background, very appropriate for this webinar here today. I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Rebecca Ilunga, who is the Water Security Network Manager at C40. Earlier this year, C40 launched the Urban Nature Declaration, which was a call to action for cities around the world to sign up to more ambitious nature targets to improve air quality, reduce emissions, and adapt to increased heating and flooding events as a result of climate change. Rebecca will introduce us to the different actions cities should and are taking to boost nature and help us understand why involving the private sector is so important. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Emily, and such a pleasure to be here today. Um, you know, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, so we all are quite aware that there's a huge over-exploitation of natural resources, and as Diego mentioned, intensive land use, which is causing significant environmental degradation, specifically in our cities. And climate change will only accelerate these processes and add new challenges within an urban context in the future. So investing in nature across city ecosystems, um, we realized is very important to provide significant societal benefits. And study after study has shown how equitable access to urban nature is beneficial for both people and the environment um, going forward. Next slide, please, Viola. So nature-based solutions, um, as Diego mentioned, such as planting trees, managing river catchments, using sustainable urban drainage systems, and creating coastal nature-based barriers are among the most effective actions in terms of both their impact and reducing risks and their feasibility. As greenhouse gas emissions, temperatures, and sea levels are all predicted to rise in the coming years, it's never been more urgent for us to accelerate efforts to bring nature into our cities. So the main objectives of implementing urban nature-based solutions are to develop crisis-prepared cities, so cities that are developing and improving their climate hazard responses, climate-ready cities that are looking at harnessing the environmental value of nature going forward, and mainstreaming adaptation actions, and living cities, which prioritize adaptation measures um, and are implemented to benefit the most vulnerable or marginalized. Achieving some of these objectives is going to be critical and simultaneously providing benefits for both climate and for biodiversity. To support a green and just recovery, cities and businesses um, should tackle the underlying drivers of health, nature, and the climate crisis. So nature-based solutions is quite a broad term when we speak about it, um, but broadly there are five categories to nature-based solutions. Restoration, issue-specific, infrastructure, management, and protection. There's no definitive list of nature-based solutions that exist, 
but they can be broadly grouped based on their objectives, their function, and level of ecosystem intervention. So some of the examples which are related to several climate hazards are currently on the slide based on extreme heat, um, urban flooding, drought, coastal flooding, and wildfires. And um, next slide, please. So at C40, a lot of our cities, um, as Emily mentioned, with the launch of the Urban Nature Declaration, we're highlighting some of the measures that they're already taking to ensure climate resilience in the future. Um, an example is in Toronto, their Urban Forest Grants and Incentives Program is looking at over 13,000 trees and shrubs being planted. And as part of this process, they're also educating and engaging communities through planting events, educational workshops, and youth programs. In Durban or Etiquini, work has already begun to complete a transformative riverine management program. And this is looking to improve the city's river systems, which will improve resilience and create thousands of green new jobs. In Medellin, temperatures have reduced by two degrees Celsius as a result of planting more than 10,000 trees for the city's green corridors project. In Mumbai, the government is making amendments to the Tree Act to protect and conserve mangrove trees and more than 9,800 hectares have been given the status of reserved forest in just the last year. And lastly, in Barcelona, um, they're looking to subsidize 75% of the cost of new green rooftops, creating urban allotments and providing safe spaces for renewable energy generation, rainwater collection and composting for urban waste. And next slide, please. So what is the role that C40 is playing that we're really excited about is we recently launched our Urban Nature Declaration. And this is just one piece in the broader organizational puzzle of all the urban nature initiatives that exist. So for example, Cities for Forests by WRI, Cities with Nature and the Leaders Pledge for Nature by WWF. What all of these initiatives plan to offer is a global network of members, political mobilization of city voices for climate action, technical assistance, research agendas, um, support for policy design and reform, and engagement with both political and technical level city officials. How some of these initiatives differ is around the emphasis on different issues. So for example, whether it's biodiversity or climate, the different scale at which the initiatives are applied and the unique members. But for us at C40, the main focus was to see how we could get both the mayors and their, techno and their technical teams to endorse this ambition towards increasing urban nature. Next slide, please. So the declaration is very much focused on making our cities greener and more resilient and um, to ensure a future with nature. And it's an opportunity for our cities to show shared ambition for climate adaptation focusing on nature as a solution that responds to multiple climate hazards. The declaration positions cities as leaders in increasing publicly and equitably accessible uh, nature in their urban environments to support regional biodiversity and reduce the climate risk, and does this through two pathways, one focus on quality total cover and one focus on equitable spatial distribution. The commitments more broadly are focused on accelerating city action, whether it's through mapping, quantified targets, barriers for implementation and addressing those, while C40 support will seek to increase nature-linked capacity building, primarily through our adaptation networks, which focus on building best practices and developing city partnerships. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what is the case for the private sector to actually step up and take leadership? As large users of natural resources, the private sector has significant impact and dependencies on natural capital, and the private sector has a critical role to play in addressing many environmental, social, and economic challenges faced today. To this end, we need to understand the opportunities for businesses to invest in nature-based solutions, or NBS, to address some of these societal challenges. As the private sector looks to prioritize building resilience in the future, more and more companies are turning to NBS to support their long-term goals and business continuity objectives. Nature-based solutions can be used as cost-effective ways to build infrastructure resilience and in response to a changing climate, while also delivering a range of other societal benefits. Yet what we're finding is that many businesses aren't aware of some of these benefits. So we've highlighted four main areas, which from our city engagement we found has been a collaboration foreground for cities. The one is around mainstreaming and how we can grow awareness of nature-based solutions benefits by integrating nature-based solutions into policies and laws, both at a city, but also at a business level. And this looks at moving beyond gray infrastructure. 
The second area is around measuring and monitoring. Both public and private sector need to adopt policy and governance frameworks and tools for identifying or monetizing the full scope of benefits of nature-based solutions. The third is focus on financing. How can we improve the sustainability of business operations as well as the environment? It's critical that more companies invest in the enhancement of nature and the natural capital that is available within an urban context. And lastly, job creation. As Diego touched on, the private sector is a key stakeholder in both urban and economic development and being a major contributor to national income and the principal job creator and employer. It'll take majority of the private sector and they'll also be in charge of a lot of the future development in urban areas. So this is a huge priority why cities actually need the private sector on board in implementing NDS. Next slide, please. Some of the co-benefits around this is that the nature-based solutions have the potential to drive transformation in the private sector to meet long-term resilience goals. So companies can start looking at how they can use these solutions to reshape their economic models to include added value from natural and social benefits while simultaneously achieving economic growth. To do this, they should actually look beyond the boundaries of their factory fences and broaden the positive influence at the city level using nature as an inspiration. No single business or government agency can actually tackle the multitude of challenges and society, both at a societal and an environmental level alone. In this context, nature-based solutions can support collaborative governance objectives at a time where joint action is going to be needed more than ever. How businesses can advocate for these NBS-friendly policies is through investing, supporting public-private partnerships, but also taking the charge and providing sector leadership where applicable. Next slide, please. From our side at C40, with regards to the declaration, one of the organizations that we're working with um, is Google, and they're looking to support some of our declaration signatory cities through their environmental insights, Explorer Tree Canopy Insights. And this looks at how they can empower cities to see their real-time information about their current tree canopy coverage to inform future tree planting projects. And we hope to roll this out ideally to a lot of other C40 cities, even if they're not necessarily declaration signatories. But just this is just one of the ways we're currently seeing the growth of support for additional implementation of urban nature. But we really hope to see more ambitious and innovative solutions coming out of the private sector in the future. And we're excited to see some of the interventions that come out of the Urban Shift Program. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Rebecca, uh, for your excellent presentation. And you touched on something very important there that no single government or a single business can act alone when it comes to implementing nature-based solutions and more broadly um, addressing the climate crisis. So thank you. So it brings me great excitement to now introduce our main speaker for today, Mr. Eric Hubbard. Eric is the Technical Advisor for Environmental Management at the Freetown City Council and for the last few years has been leading the mayor's vision to plant 1 million trees in the city by 2022. In 2017, Freetown suffered a huge landslide, killing over a thousand people and displacing 5,000 others. It was the deadliest natural disaster in the world that year. The city hopes that by planting more trees across the entire city region, they can stabilize the soil, restore natural systems and capture greenhouse gases to combat climate change. At the same time, bring nature back to the city will improve well-being, have a number of health benefits and provide jobs for local people in the community. I'd now like to share a two minute video with you called Welcome to Freetown, the Tree Town. I was born in Freetown, Sierra Leone, and I'm a Freetonian. As a child, I remember walking through these areas. It was so green and thick with forests. We will climb trees and swim in streams. This is my city. I love it. My name is Yira. I work with FedUp and we are partners in the Freetown City Council. Our mission is to improve people's lives by building urban climate resilience in Freetown. Freetown is a beautiful city, but we have been impacted heavily by climate change. Freetown the Tree Town is our city's ambitious plan to plant a million trees over two rainy seasons. But we're not just planting trees, we're growing them, which means communities are involved, which means we're tracking them, which means we're monitoring their growth, and we're bringing new life 
to hillsides, to mangroves, to forested areas. The COVID pandemic highlighted the importance of food security and growing our own food locally. Urban gardens allow people to grow their own food in their own backyard or even on their balconies. We have provided garden tools and seeds and showed people now they can even use everyday items to create their own gardens. A million trees will not fix climate change, but it will reduce flooding and landslides. It will ensure that we bring back biodiversity into our cities. It'll ensure that the mangrove areas where our fishes are spawned are restored. It will really make a significant impact. My hope is that future generations will be able to enjoy nature and wildlife of free time, just like I did as a child. Nature is good. I love nature. Wow, what a beautiful video. It uh, gives me chills every time I watch that video. So Eric, as we just saw in that video, Freetown is really leading the way uh, in its ambition to implement nature-based solutions in urban areas to restore natural systems. And while I think now most people understand that there are a multitude of benefits uh, to increasing nature in cities, often the next step, actually implementing the trees and finding the funding for that is the biggest barrier the governments face. Well, as I understand, the city of Freetown has managed to go that extra step and find creative ways to independently fund green infrastructure development in the city by partnering with businesses and creating a carbon credit token scheme. So my first question to you is, how did Freetown City Council decide to work with businesses on this initiative? And what were the motivations behind this? Why not just do it alone or apply for grants? Mm. Well, Great questions, Emily. Uh, doing it alone um, is impossible. Um, as a, a city of limited resources, um, we do not have the own source resources um, or the level of direct transfer from central government to be able to directly finance um, the, the level of um, green infrastructure that's required for adaptation. Um, and so we needed to build uh, strong and durable partnerships. Um, and even within the context of grants, um, if they're couched in the context of traditional climate finance, they're, it's very difficult to get. Um, we have been very lucky uh, because we were able to um, attract uh, resources from the World Bank uh, that we were able to leverage. And there are a couple of other um, processes in the pipeline uh, where we've been able to leverage resources that come in as grants. But what we've decided to do is not think about the resources as grants. We look at impact investment. So we wanted to understand how we can um, understand and articulate to partners uh, the value uh, in our natural capital, uh, in, in, the, 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 in nature uh, and, the, and green infrastructure. Uh, and so we built within, when thinking about Freetown, the tree town, we wanted to build a way that we can create a context of investment in our trees that would allow us to have your sort of private sector partnerships um, that is linked to uh, eventually to carbon offsets, but also to social corporate responsibility dynamics, but, but something that drives value. Uh, and so in doing so, we first needed to structure a system that would allow us to be able to digitally capture every tree. So we partnered with uh, a technology firm, uh, a nonprofit, called Green Stand uh, that had an innovative process of tree tracking um, where you can 
you track your trees. So the folks who plant them, growers, uh, track individual trees. Uh, and then on the basis of periodic tracking of those trees to show survival, they receive payments. But what happens then is that we are, we are able then to take those trees, put them into the system and do something called uh, organize them. So each tree, yeah, we link a impact token or a value to the tree. And that allows us then to be able to trade it. We actually have a, a slide that actually kind of walks through that process. And if we could just kind of walk through that a bit. So we have uh, our community growers. So this is a community growing model. 80% of all of the resources that are generated in this process go back into the communities, you know, sort of where the tree growing is happening. And so the tree growers have an app. We have a tree tracker app that was customized for us by GreenStack. Uh, and each tree grower uses that app. They register, they take a selfie, yeah, they uh, plant a tree and then they track it using the app and then they upload it. Once it's uploaded, then it comes onto our system. And we have a team of fantastic young data techs who verify every tree, make sure it's not a duplicate tree or you know, sort of it's actually a tree. <laughs> Um, and those kinds of dynamics. And the most important thing is that it is living. It is surviving. And then on the basis of that, we move micropayments uh, to the grower. But the, the issue though is once we get that tree, we verify that tree, we're then able to uh, add what we call um, uh, a token, yeah? So that impact tokens is a code uh, that we then make into basically currency that says for each token, it, it values, it's linked to trees, one tree that is existing and one future tree. And we put a value on it, let's say $6. And we create inside of our system, a digital wallet. That digital wallet is the Freetown wallet. And so every tree that goes into the system is linked to an impact token. That impact token is something that we can then through um, outreach, relationships, um, pitching, uh, discussion and partnerships with uh, uh, private sector entities, um, that corporations, but also institutions um, engage in a contractual agreement where they can then invest in our trees. And what they would do then is let's say 1000 trees. If it's 1000 trees, um, then it's 500 tokens. And so if they've purchased 500 tokens from us, then they purchase those tokens at $6 each. Uh, and then we have created on our system, you know, sort of a, a secure API that then transfers the tokens. Uh, and then also where we, a payment system, a localized payment system, where we can then receive the resources. And then those resources are allocated back to growers. So we are collecting data, which are our trees, we turn those trees into impact tokens. We put them into a digital wallet. And then for that digital wallet where those tokens are, we can then create digital wallets for corporate and institutional investors. These are, uh, this is our pathway to offering carbon offsets. Those carbon offsets um, would be uh, attached to, for instance, uh, net zero pledges. Uh, that have been made by those particular entities. And we target entities like, you know, Sierra Leone Breweries, which is uh, Heineken, uh, which has, you know, pledged to be um, carbon neutral, uh, to decarbonize by, by 2030 and decarbonize all of its global uh, supply chains by 2040. And they are the owner, they are the majority stakeholder, stakeholder in uh, Sierra Leone Breweries. Uh, so it, that pledge links directly here. And so we sat with them to have a conversation uh, about how we can help them get there uh, and they can help us to create green jobs. Uh, within the context of the way in which we structure the process, all of the growers um, have um, an initial lifespan of um, three years of payments, right? Uh, because we look at trees that grow and not, are, not just trees that are planted. So if we are growing trees, then we have to think about the investment that is required in those trees over the 
the period that needs to bring them to establishment. Uh, and so that kind of longevity that is required, that kind of input, you can't, you don't normally get that out of a grant, right? Um, no. It just, it, they're not structured that way. That has to be a part of an enduring investment. Uh, and so that is what drove us, you know, sort of to think about value and then think about partners who understand how to drive value. And that took us immediately to thinking about how we engage the private sector. Fantastic. And what I find totally wonderful and really unique about your case study here in Freetown is that it's really the city driving this process. It's not a nonprofit coming to you saying you've got space. It's you saying we've got the space. We want to plant a million trees. We want to improve the lives of the people in our city. And we want to go out and find businesses, help them meet their targets and then help them to meet our targets to plant a million trees. And I think that's that's really wonderful. And I think what many city people on this webinar will be curious to know is how did the relationship with these businesses? So, for example, you you've partnered with a business called Phenorex, which is a diaspora uh, fashion company. And how did that relationship start and what were you looking for in the partnership? And as you've been going on these partnerships, what have been the main challenges and the opportunities you found in these partnerships right. so far? Well, one of the ways we wanted to look at expanding this is we, we thought of, this is a community model, right? Uh, and we want as many individuals involved as in the process as possible. Uh, and so the, the idea then, if we're going to focus only on corporations and institutions um, and then structure a process where the tokens move to that dynamic, um, it doesn't allow us to be able to bring in um, individuals. It's kind of, we can't offer offsets to individuals, right? Uh, and we want to keep it within the context of how we actually drive value. So the thinking was, how do we create a retail relationship? How do we create a dynamic where we can um, build uh, sales, yeah, that are associated, you know, with, with our trees? Uh, and so, in came uh, a conversation with Phenorex, uh, which is a, like you said, a sustainable fashion uh, brand um, that is run by uh, folks from the Sierra Leone di diaspora. Uh, and so what we were thinking is that if we had, um, you know, sort of a digital process that's connected to garments and people purchase those garments, then the tokens are embedded in that purchase. But what happens uh, is that they can then be linked to a process uh, of supporting you know, um, green growth within the context of our city and then linked to our city and linked to the growth of trees that are, and then linked to the growers that are growing those trees and linked to the change uh, an impact that is happening in the communities over time. Offering people that kind of opportunity with a purchase um, is a way to create, you know, the ability for people to contribute by, you know, sort of not doing too much, but wanting to do a lot. Uh, and so those resources that are linked back to the process of change in Freetown, the, the key thing is that we allow them to see that change happen. It goes back to the idea that we track the trees and every tree that's tracked is on a web map. So we actually have evidence of the growth and the survival of the trees. Those trees now belong to those impact owners and they're able to track their trees and to share the growth and to share their uh, part uh, in that growth. You know, of, of the trees that will create all types of um, co-benefits, um, both for the city and for its residents. Fantastic. And I a, believe we have a video uh, explaining how it works, uh, the yeah. whole QR system. The Phenar X Tree Town Wallet. Fashion and technology to help fight climate change. How it works. Step one. Purchase a shirt with a tree code. Each Fiener X Tree Town item comes with a unique token linked to a tree growing in Freetown, Sierra Leone. Step two, register your unique tree code. 
Watching your tree grow is as easy as logging in to see the GPS location and environmental impact. Step three, track your growth and share your progress. Share your earth-friendly impact and leave your legacy using the community leaderboard. They say they are sustainable, we can show it. With the Tree Wallet app, the power is in your hands. Join us in making Freetown the Tree Town. Coming soon. Amazing. And so that's how the wallet works. You have QR code, you scan it, and you can see your impact tokens on the platform. Uh, is that right? That's exactly right. And it's all connected to a website that has different types of merchandise um, that are affordably priced. Uh, and then within the context of that, our tokens you know, are included in that process. So the purchase then moves back into you know, sort of the, uh, the Freetown wallet uh, and then is linked to growers in particular areas. So if you purchase um, you know, a t-shirt for instance, uh, kind of like the one that I'm wearing by the way. So if you actually uh, purchase a t-shirt, you will then have the ability to um, say that you've actually supported trees. And as demonstrated in that video, you would actually be able to see the trees, see the grower, see, you know, actually experience that dynamic and that experience, you know, sort of directly on your phone. Um, and so the, 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 the point there is that we want to kind of bridge a dynamic where wherever you are in the world, um, you can you know, sort of have a piece you know, sort of, of the, the growth and the pathway to climate resilience that's happening in the city through, um, through these types of nature-based solutions and the planting of one million trees. Fantastic. And so I just want to remind the audience, if you have any questions for our speakers, please do post them in the Q&A box. We'll come to all of your questions in a minute. I just have one more question for you, Eric. So basically, if you were a city official in another city somewhere in the world, what would you recommend to them to implement nature-based solutions in their cities? And if they haven't explored this idea to partner up with businesses, why do you think they should do that? And how does that increase the impact of their project? Okay. The, the first thing that I would say is that we all need to do some level of natural capital assessment, right? Uh, to understand the kind of value that your natural capital has uh, so that you can build, you know, sort of a, a sustainable investment strategy uh, that would allow you to be able to drive value out of that natural capital uh, and then to be able to partner, uh, whether it's a partnership with the private sector or even you know, sort of the you know sort of the multilateral banks or the rest. But the idea is that we need to understand the type of value that we have within our nature. Uh, and then how you're sort of conserving it, right? Um, will in fact you know, create green jobs, um, will you know, sort of increase um, um, all of the, the critical co-benefits um, uh, around your know, sort of you know, sort of reductions in air, um, you know, sort of an increase in air quality, uh, sort of a, a increase in water quality, uh, looking at heat stress reduction, all of those kinds of dynamics, you know, sort of those types of ecosystem services are exactly what we need to achieve. And in order for us to achieve that, you know, we need to look at the adaptation side in a particular way. Uh, and then understand the types of nature-based solutions that we require. You know, restoration is one of them. And within the context of restoration, we will, with our 1 million trees, restore 3,000 hectares of land. And within that, on the mitigation side, sequester roughly about 78,000 tons of, of CO2, um, which gets us not there, but gets us on the pathway uh, to the, the type of adaptation scenario that we need to, where we need to be. So first you need to understand the trajectory, what you have, and then think about it in a different way. You know, less grants, more investment. Even if it is a grant, turn it into investment. The way that we were able to, we are, we're on a trajectory that takes us out five years. 
we are right now leveraging World Bank resources. Um, we are one of the 50 champion cities of the Bloomberg Mayors Challenge. Uh, and so if we move to the next stage, which we believe we will, uh, we receive a million dollars over three years. Yeah, we see this also as additional investment. By 2023, we intend through this process, through you know, offering you know, uh, carbon offsets uh, and engaging in social corporate responsibility funding that comes directly from your know, private businesses and from institutions, we will be able to begin to finance 25% of all of our growing needs from through, through this particular system. The following year, we want to increase that to 50%. We want to be able to leverage all of the resources that have come in through the traditional means uh, and then create an investment strategy around our natural capital uh, that would allow us then to build out the type of green infrastructure that puts us on a sustainable pathway. Uh, so we need to be thinking about what kind of sustainable financing we can get. Uh, and the, the issue is when we think about that, we always think about um, the various types of uh, bank finance dynamics, which is important and we need to go after them. Uh, and they're getting more accessible, but they've been hard in the past. So for us, yeah. uh, a very low resource city, right? Um, that can't necessarily you know, finance that pathway um, through national funding or from our own source resources. Um, and getting some of the external resources are difficult. We needed to think a, around a way where we can create value within the context of the capital, natural capital we have, and then you know, sort of really um, uh, take uh, leverage also the relationships to our, um, to our private sector uh, and to global private sector uh, that operates in our spaces. Definitely. I think you have a huge task on your hands. There is, I don't think any city in the world planning this much ambition to plant this many trees. And I think it's wonderful that you already talk about green investment across the city, green infrastructure more broadly. So how can investment be kind of driven across other green infrastructure projects, not just tree planting, which I think will be really exciting for us to watch. I'd now like to um, pose some questions to our speakers. So I invite all of our speakers to come back to the, the main room with me. Um, the first question I have is from Mandy Eicher. She says, are most of the corporate or institutional investors multinationals? I'm guessing those are the ones that have the largest carbon offset goals. I wonder how the local private sector is involved and can they buy the impact tokens for a lower price to participate? So Eric, that one's for you. Um, the answer is yes, yes, yes. Um, we actually have um, the first impact tokens uh, that we that we actually sold um, were 300 tokens for uh, $6 each uh, at 1,800 US dollars. And it was to a local firm. Um, in fact, it's, it's an Indian firm, uh, but they operate here locally, a factory. Um, and we, we did it through the, um, our relationship with the Indian High Commission. Uh, and so once we did that one, we've got about 10 uh, other local entities that are in line to be able to do it. We want to make sure that this is a local process. And then also we look at the, the multinationals. So we want to be able to leverage the, the local firms um, and because they are the users of our water and our nature, aren't they? <laughs> Uh, and so they should invest, you know, sort of in, you know, sort of in preserving it and protecting it. Uh, and they see that. Uh, so, yes, local. Brilliant. Um, I'd now like to pose a question to Rebecca. So we've heard in Freetown they're planning to plant one million trees, but for very dense, very urbanized cities that perhaps don't have as much free space to plant lots of trees, um, what nature-based solutions could they implement and what factors should they consider in this decision-making process? And, and how can they involve the private sector in that decision-making? 
Thanks so much for the question. And I love hearing from Freetown. It's always so inspirational. Um, so I think the one thing we'd really like to highlight around um, the nature of based solutions and the different types cities can look at implementing is very much to focus on the hazard that they're trying to address. Um, I think in the video, May Yvonne says, you know, emerging trees won't necessarily solve climate change, but it's a start. And I think in the Freetown context, it was kind of the right start. Um, and different cities need to consider that from an adaptation perspective and um, looking at their specific hazards. So as I mentioned earlier, whether it's mangroves, whether it's trees, whether it's sustainable urban drainage systems, it's very context specific um, when it comes to adaptation and the application can take several forms. Um, with regards to factors to consider, there are several, um, as everyone has touched on, whether it's environmental, whether it's cultural, or whether it's socioeconomic. Um, mainstreaming monitoring and finance are definitely still at the foreground, but essentially it does come down to um, people, whether it's cities or businesses, actually rethinking their spaces and not seeing it as this is the way our space is and this is how it needs to remain in future. And um, as Freetown's done, a million trees is going to take up space, but it will change the landscape of the city and cities actually getting to a point where they understand that it doesn't always need to look the same. Um, with regards to how to involve businesses, um, one really important thing with regards to land use is that um, there isn't that much public space available in necessarily every city. Um, some of it is privately owned, and so we really need businesses to come to the table with regards to that. But looking beyond kind of the corporate social responsibility that cities have, um, we need to acknowledge that businesses can also reduce their own risk through this. And I think one of the questions that was asked um, in the chat was around, well, how can we encourage them that this helps with their bottom line? And um, I think, as Eric mentioned, if they realize that they use the water, they use the land, they still benefit from it, that does indirectly or directly in many cases affect their bottom line. So it's very much around changing the mindsets of businesses, um, but most importantly, getting businesses to see an innovative perspective and coming up with new ways of doing things and bringing that innovation to the urban context. Fantastic. Thanks, Rebecca. And, and I suppose the other thing, at least in the context of Freetown, is that actually many of the trees you're planting aren't directly in the urbanised areas themselves. It's kind of around and it's this idea that a city isn't just, you know, the dense part where people live, but it's all these borders around it as well. Right. It's it's a bit of both. So we are we are, as they call what, fully urbanised. <laughs> We're at the brim, our city. Uh, so there are not a lot of spaces, but we are focusing on uh, of, of areas of degradation, particularly around the you know, protected areas and particularly around our watershed and the rest, um, looking at you know, particular types of green spaces and bringing those particular spaces back and being very strategic about what we can do inside. But we also have a very strong partnership with the Western Area Rural District Council which is another local council that is right next to ours. Yeah, you can pass the line and kind of forget you've left Freetown. Um, we're linked together. Uh, and the thing is this, all of our water supply is sitting there. Yeah. Um, so all of the dynamics that you know, sort of create, your know, sort of engines for growth, quite a number of them in terms of the natural side um, are sitting you know, sort of there. So we needed to, when we talk about Freetown, the tree town, it is a deep collaboration between two local councils, right? So it's also the Freetown Peninsula uh, because half of the trees that we're planting just about you know, are planted there uh, because we are planting to protect our water supply. And so when we talk to businesses, that's, we talk about you know, sort of the shared risk we all have uh, and how we have shared responsibilities to be able to mitigate that risk. Uh, and sort of having that conversation about particularly we're on a trajectory of five to 10 years of losing our water supply. Yeah. Uh, if we continue with the level of um, deforestation that's happening and particularly in the watershed areas. Uh, so we need to change that trajectory, change that dynamic. So we have to do the work in terms of changing behaviors, creating incentives. Yeah. So one of the core things that we do is that we incentivize in those areas where they've been cutting, we're incentivizing communities to plant integrated areas and to protect those trees to establishment. We're creating alternatives to those processes, to livelihood dynamics that have been disenabling to the environment uh, and you know, filled with risk. And 
businesses see that. They see the value in that and they see how they can directly benefit from it. Definitely. And tying to this idea of, of working to plant in the degraded areas, we have a question from Steve um, who says, how often do you track the trees and how are you employing locals to physically check the trees? And do you train these uh, tree trackers? Okay. All right. So they're tree growers. Yes, they're using a tree tracking system. And yes, brother, they are all locals. <laughs> they are from the areas where they're actually, uh, where the planting is actually happening. So if we are going to, basically we're using a model of, you know, sort of 1,000 trees to one person, yeah? If we're talking about 1 million trees, then we're talking about 500 growers. The way that we do it is that we, we started tracking every month. That's actually a little too soon. You know, so we track every two months. But there's care and maintenance that's going on all throughout. So they have the responsibility to care for those trees you know, sort of every month. Yeah. They get a payment of 1.2 million leons yeah, every two months over a period of 36 months, three years. Yeah. In some cases, that'll be five years. Um, but in terms of the tree that they plant, every tree that they plant, we have it has a three year trajectory. And so that means 18 payments of 1.2 million leones, which is about 21 million leones, which is a significant amount. It is a meaningful amount of supplemental income um, for anyone living in those communities. Uh, so we needed to create and with the community, what drives, what would drive people to change behavior? which would drive them to actually replace and keep those trees there. And then think about strategies. If those trees are there, they're right alongside existing trees. So we don't want them to cut those to be cut either. <laughs> so the idea is that we are looking at a strategy you know, to incentivize the protection of all of the trees in that space. Uh, and so, yes, uh, it is done through a community model of local folks who live in those communities they are incentivized to grow. There's a payment scheme that they get, but it's based on if they track, you have to track all the trees that, that are allotted to you. And you have to be able to demonstrate that those trees are growing. Yeah. And so your payment is on the basis of growth. So, you know, a tracking, every tracking has to be verified. Yeah. So a tree has to be verified every time. So we have that team that are looking, they verify that these trees are growing. We have a system that they're all trained on, yeah? The, the app that they use to collect it, they take pictures of the trees, they use a 45 degree or 90 degree angle. We have, um, we have um, what is it, calibrated uh, the, the phones to be able to, when they take the picture, we can actually see growth. Uh, and so we are looking for a change in that tree from this period to that period. That growth, you get paid. Amazing. I'm really happy that you're involving local people. And I mean, this is this is really like what we're looking for in the in the next implementation phase is, is how do we get this green transition? How do we get people into jobs that are doing great things and improving their communities? So this is a really fantastic example of that. Um, I think we have one more question from the audience that we have time for, which is from Christian, who said, who came up? Well, he said, really great project. Who came up with the this idea to link the trees to the shirts via the QR code? Was this a company's idea? Because he thinks it adds real value to the company far beyond just offsetting. It's good promotional material, right? Yes. Um, it was very much collective. <laughs> we, we, have, we had already created the codes, right? Um, and the idea is how do we create a context um, to, you know, because the token is basically the QR code, right? Um, so it's not a physical token. Uh, and so the idea, then we were looking at how we can move this forward. And then the idea was that, okay, if we actually partner with a fashion brand and we, we were talking with them about how to do it and they were talking about, you know, sort of printing shirts. And then we thought, hmm, we could actually link it together so people can actually see their trees. Um, so, yeah, so we, we came up with the idea together. I can't, well, I won't remember if it was them or us. I'll just say we both did it. <laughs> well, it was a fantastic yeah. idea. Whoever did it. And I really hope that many other businesses will follow suit and uh, get in touch with you um, about this initiative. 
So I think that's all we have time for. Um, what a fantastic you know, note to end on. Thank you to Rebecca. Thank you, Diego. Thank you to Eric uh, for all of your wise words today. Um, all that leaves me is to thank all of the people working hard behind the scenes to organize, run, interpret this webinar, and also to all of you in the audience for showing up, being open to learning, and also for asking so many great questions. So coming up, we have an Urban Shift side event at COP26 on the 9th of November titled Sustainable, Integrated and Inclusive Urban Development to Transform Cities for People and the Planet, uh, the Importance of Multi-Level Governance, which will be live streamed directly from COP26 in Glasgow. We'll also be hosting our next webinar in this series towards the end of November, focused on India's experience with subnational climate reporting, uh, which will be led by my colleagues at ICLEI. So if you enjoyed the conversation today and want to stay posted, you can sign up to the Urban Shift newsletter via the website, email us at urbanshift at shiftcities.org, or follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. With that, thank you all for joining and I wish you a wonderful day. Goodbye. Bye-bye.